I think if you asked me to describe Andrea Rice, she has like this uh, distinguished presence. Like it's like you don't mess with her or like, wow, she embodies confidence. And I hope that she hears this because I think for a person to hear the perspective from somebody else is a nice reminder. And sometimes we, we need to hear it from other people. So my challenge for you as you listen to this is find the things that you can learn from people that you meet. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about Andrea. She is a North America community specialist with Lululemon, which involves all kinds of new learning curves and new strategies and new lessons and new implementations. I'm just throwing big words at you. It's really hard to describe what she does, but I know that she makes a huge impact, which is why she came on the podcast and I was so happy to have her and you'll enjoy this. Make sure to share it with a friend. Thanks for listening. Welcome to the Lifestyle Chase Season 2. This podcast features high performers who have found a way to live their best life while balancing their health, wellness, friends, and family. I'm your host, Chris Little. Let's get started. The Lifestyle Chase is brought to you by Yeg Fitness. Yeg Fitness is Edmonton, Alberta, Canada's healthy lifestyle community, creating and supporting active living for all. Check them out online at yegfitness.ca and on social media at Yeg Fitness. So, we will get started. Okay. Right. So, welcome to the Lifestyle Chase episode 91. I am joined today by Andrea Rice. How are you doing? I'm so good. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. It's a pleasure to shoot the shit with you today. Yes, <laughs> I can't wait to, I can't imagine what we're going to talk about. So, it's going to be great. So, how has your day been today? Like, what, what have you been up to so far? My day today has been probably a little bit unusual for a Friday for me. So I actually saw my chiropractor this morning, Dr. Kara. She fixed me up. So I see her. I see her actually proactively. I try not to wait till I'm injured. I try to go on a regular basis to prevent injury. Um, and because I did that, I actually work from home today. So typically I work um, out of a co-work called Work Nicer, which is in downtown Edmonton. But today, since I was out and about early this morning, I was like, no, I'm just going to work from home. So... It was nice. I, I got a lot accomplished today, although I was very distracted by the food in my kitchen, which is a great reason why I can't work from home because I just, <laughs> you know, always I'm distracted by a snack. Yeah. Um, I know some people are like, I do my laundry or it's really hard because I want to clean this. And I'm like, no, I just eat all day when I work from home. But it was nice to be at home today. So it was good. I like it. What's your go-to snack? What, what's your weakness when it comes to snacks? Oh, I like snacks a lot. Um, today I ate a lot of dried mango, a lot of dried mango, but my go-to, I don't know, I don't really think I have a go-to. I eat a lot of fruit. Yeah. I eat a lot of nuts. I really like chocolate. Um, I try not to have too much of that in the house because I'm not very good at moderation. I'm kind of an all or nothing type person. So if I have like a bag of chocolate in my house, I just eat it until it's gone. Yeah. Um, which doesn't always bode well for my stomach, but yeah, I, I like to eat. So I always have lots of good snacks around my house to, to munch on depending on the day. That's awesome. Um, if you were going to describe yourself in like one to three sentences or whatever it takes, how would you describe yourself if you're just like you have a billboard and it has to explain everything about you what would that say <laughs> i only have three sentences on you a can billboard. use like seven sentences if you like <laughs> but i feel like i'm complicated no i'm not really at all actually that would be the first thing is i'm a simple gal from northern ontario i really love to sweat i mean I'm, i would classify myself as a runner but um i just like to sweat in general um, I'm an extroverted introvert. I really love people. I love connection. And I also really crave time on my own. So I read a lot. I spend a lot of time by myself. I'm, I'm happy doing that. So uh, uh, is that three things? I don't know. I'm like extroverted introvert, loves connection, loves people, loves running, loves sweat from Northern Ontario. Yeah, that would probably like cover it in a nutshell. I don't yeah, know. <laughs> 
three sentences is hard. <laughs> I need to prep for that one, Chris. I know. I, I'm, I'm rough because it's just like, well, do you have anything for preparation? And I send you like a few things and then I ask completely opposite things. I can't help it. But in any case, so when it comes to like, because you like to have your time to sort of recharge, to mm-hmm. read, all that stuff. Um, what what would be your go-to routine? Say you're just like, you had the week from hell. How do you recharge in a scenario like that? I definitely go running or go to yoga. So those would be my first two go-tos is just um, getting on my mat or getting out for a run. And although I really, really love doing those things in a group, if I've had a rough go, I'll definitely just go by myself just to sort of be alone with my my own thoughts. And I process a lot of things when I'm moving, so sometimes that's helpful for me. I think I realize when things have felt hard after I run or after I've done a yoga class, it, it's not always the case that they're that hard. I've worked through it a little bit, so definitely sweat for sure helps me with that. And uh, yeah, like... I love to cook, so I'll like go and like pick three recipes, go buy a bunch of groceries, put on some podcasts, I listen to yours a lot, um, put on the food channel, put on some music, cook. I, like I said, I read a lot, um, which I don't always try to do like midday because I'm one of those people that when I read, I fall asleep. So typically that's like an end of the day wind down thing for me. I'll journal or, or meditate. Um, journaling was definitely not a practice that came very naturally to me and a lot of people say oh you know I write in my journal and I was always really envious of that because I felt like I wanted to do that but it's taken me a good three years I'd say to get myself in like a consistent practice with that so um, running it out if I can't run it out writing it out usually usually helps so I mean those I would say are the main things sometimes I just like to you know FaceTime someone and spend a good hour just chatting about life or about you know nothing in particular um, I've lived in a lot of different places, I guess, over the last seven years or, or more. So I have really deep connections with people in a lot of different places. So I, um, I'm thankful for FaceTime. It doesn't, you know, cost anything to stay connected and caught up. So that's another, um, I would say way that I really like dial myself down get back into the root of things it's just like connection with people that i love and sometimes that doesn't happen in person yeah and i can totally relate to that like i've gotten to meet so many people through the podcast and through my travel for like continuing education probably like once or twice a week i'll have like a a video call with somebody and it's like it might not be in person but it still counts for something like that's why i do as many podcast episodes as i do because it's just like it it helps to keep us resilient and helps to like stir the thoughts in, in our head to kind of keep it fresh and keep ourselves on a positive outlook. Like it's super For sure. helpful. I love that. So what was it like? You, you grew up in Northern Ontario? I did, yeah. So what was awesome. that experience like that for you? Oh, it was, I mean, incredible. So I grew up in a small town called Kenora, which is two hours east of Winnipeg. So the climate's not unlike Edmonton. Like people always say like, oh, like you must hate the cold in Edmonton. And I'm like, no, I've, you know, lived in the cold my whole life. So um, it was the same. And yeah, I I grew up um, in a really cool place in Canada. So uh, Kenora is right on a lake in Northern Ontario. So I think the best way to describe it is everyone has a boat. Everyone, you know, gets out on the lake. I was fortunate enough to grow up on the lake. We had a cottage when I was really small. Um, we called it camp. Everyone there calls their cottage their camp, and it was um, it was a camp. is very humble. I mean, we had we had running water, but we didn't have indoor plumbing, like nothing like that. So I spent a lot of time at the lake. Um, so I've been really, I would say, naturally drawn to the outdoors and nature my whole life. I really crave to be around the lake, around water, and then in the winter it's crazy. Like everything freezes. Everyone like I learned how to drive on an ice road. You know when I was when I was very young much younger than you're supposed to be taking the wheel of a car but um, that's what happens when you grow up in a northern Ontario small town it's a really um, outdoors oriented place so people fish they hunt they cross-country ski they skate um, I can say it's a town that's really like big into hockey um, it's very it's quite rural so I mean it's two hours from Winnipeg but after Kenora, the next city is Thunder Bay in Ontario, which is a good six hours away. And it's also the last town um, 
it's like an access point for a lot of northern uh, reserves um, that would have, like Kenora would be sort of their first, I would say, like biggest center of access when they're driving or flying in from the north. So it's a really unique place. I've never been in another place like it. I get a lot of people that ask like, oh, is it like Kelowna? And I'm like, no, not at all. Um, the lake isn't like a big open mass of water. It's got islands and it's just really, really cool. It's, it's hard to explain, but I would encourage everyone to look it up. Kenora, Ontario, it's a really, it's a really wonderful place to go to, to be and to spend time in. So yeah, I, I actually grew up as a competitive swimmer. So when I was young, I, I spent a lot of time at the pool going back and forth. Uh, kept me out of trouble, which is always a good thing, um, and taught me a lot just about, I would say, like discipline and practice. And I think that's also where I learned that, you know, I actually like to decompress on my own. Because, I mean, yes, of course, when you swim, you're a part of a team, but you're just, you're just doing it on your own, you know? So, yeah, I, I really love where I grew up, and I spent a lot of time there still. So I own a cottage there with my sister. My mom and dad still live there for part of the year. My family lives mainly in Winnipeg, so I go back a lot. And I feel really lucky that I'm very connected to the place that I grew up. I know I feel like some people grow up and then grow out of where they, they grew up, and that's not been the case for me. I, I crave time there. I don't want to live there full time, um, but I crave, I crave my time there for sure. So, like, if it's anything like anywhere that I go to to sort of, like, recharge or a place that I just I need to go back to but wouldn't be able to live at I find that I have like epiphanies of sorts mm -hmm. um is that an experience that you've had when when you go back for a visit I guess in some ways I think the thing I crave the most there is just the slower pace of life and the quiet um and by all means I don't live an incredibly like busy or fast-paced life in the city I think a lot, a lot of people do that better or do that more than me but I like the simplicity of catching a fish off the dock and eating it for dinner and uh, just moving really slow through my day. Um, I don't have connection to the internet. We don't have internet at our cottage. We don't have TV. We plan to keep it that way for as much as possible. Um, we really just don't want, like I, we still have a landline. So if you want to call us, you got to call our landline. Probably no one's going to answer it anyway, but <laughs> if you need to get a hold of us, you can call the landline. Um, yeah, I think this summer we had like a little bit better cell reception and sometimes I catch myself like, why do I even need to be looking at my my email or at my social media or at my phone right now? There's zero reason for it. So I think that's the biggest thing that I, I sort of like package up and take in my soul when I leave there is just that calm, slow um, pace of life and I really, really, really need to be around water. I know that for sure about myself. So in Edmonton, that's a little bit harder. Um, I mean, we have a great river and I live close to it, which is lucky for me. And I'll often just go and um, sit there to, to be with the water. But that's something I didn't, I didn't learn about myself without time and space. And um, I think like just learning to really be and connect with the land is important to me. I like it. And it's just like perspective is such a powerful thing. Like to be able to see things at a slower pace and go back to the other pace and just see things differently. Cause like, I think when something becomes such a normal thing for us, then we, we don't realize like the little intricacies that we can change or the adjustments that we can make to get back to like more of a, a grounded state. So yeah, like I can totally see where you would get the value from getting there and like operating from a landline that nobody even cares to really check on and just like, yeah, fishing and enjoying the water. Yeah. And all the like little fun nuances that go with it. Like I always say, um, you know, at one end of our, uh, of our dock, we have like this, a couple summers ago, we had a massive dock spider that literally every summer when I'd be walking down to the dock, there he is sitting on the rock sunning himself. And probably before I used to be like, I used to think like, ugh, that gross, a big spider. I don't want it there. Now I was kind of looking at him, I'm like, okay, awesome, you stay there, I'm going to that end, all good, we can coexist. I almost, you know, looked forward to see, seeing it, him, I call it him, I don't even know if it could be a female, I don't know. I looked forward to seeing him every day, and it's the same with, like, we have a mass of, or actually two really big snapping turtles that hang out, and I think they're the same snapping turtles that have likely been there for, like, years. 
um, I call I call him Terry, which then my dad was like, well, it's a female because it co- comes up to lay its eggs. And I was like, could it still be Terry? Yeah. I don't know. Um, anyways, I just like the, now, you know, I'll see him in the water and he's big and ugly and not that pleasant to look at, but I'm always just like, oh, he's still, still here. Great. Okay, you're in the water in here. I'm not going to get in right now. I'll just wait, you know? Um, but I like those sort of, intricacies of life at the lake and the things that become routine are just so different than what like becomes routine in the city um and not that either is is good or bad they just are but i i really crave that about the lake like waking up in the morning and just hearing the wind in the trees or um laying uh, you know to fall asleep at night and hearing that too and it's it's so quiet and a lot of people that i've invited from the city when they get out there especially at night they're like you you can't hear anything Except if there's like wind or if there's wildlife, then you hear that. But there's there's nothing to hear. Which well, is my yeah, favorite. like I, I grew up on an acreage, and it's something growing up. It's like oh whatever, just it's dark out. Like can't we go do something? And then you get older and you go back and say like, oh, I really like this silence thing. Yeah. I could hide in a tree or something. <laughs> and nobody would know where I was. <laughs> It's a, it's a good way to reflect, and it sounds like you kind of lived a, a fairly active life growing up, like... Yes, yeah, definitely. Um, I think I've always been an athlete. My parents put my sister and I both in competitive swimming when we were really young because we grew up around the water and they wanted us to be good swimmers in case something ever happened. Um, and yeah, I, I was always really, really invested in that. Um, and I would say in my mid twenties, I like a lot, I shouldn't say like a lot of people I'll speak from I, this is my experience. Um, I got lost a bit in the party scene. Like I went to university, I was living away from home. I planned on swimming. I didn't, I ended up, um, quitting and just sort of doing my thing. And, um, I didn't realize how much I missed it until I then started running. Um, so I think, yeah, I've always been, I've always been a little bit of an athlete, even if I, I lost that for a certain amount of time. Um, and again, I think what's important for me in that is like the consistent, the, the consistency, the, the, the dedication to like whatever it is that you're doing. So I guess some people can say like, well, it's just pursuit of a goal. And even when I'm not necessarily training for something, I still really crave that like, okay, like today at this time, I'm gonna do this, you know? So, and I've definitely got that from a lifetime in sport or athletics. So, like, being active, I would I would declare that as one of your many non-negotiables, probably, hey? Like, oh, yeah, I'm a terrible person to be around if I haven't had, like, any kind of a release through sweat, I'd say, for sure. So, I think right now, I'm just trying to live by the, like, sweat once a day, whatever that looks like. And some days, I just go for a walk. Um, and again, I think... Um, being outside is something I really crave, which is why I think running has always worked so well for me. Um, but yeah, definitely it's a non-negotiable. I'm, I'm, I can tell when I need to go, like I get antsy, I get a little bit short, I get frustrated easier. So it's a good way for me to look after my mental health, um, just movement. Yeah. So like what else goes on to that list of non-negotiables for you? Oh my gosh. Um, I'm really working a lot right now on my sleep. I have I have struggled with sleep for a really long time, so I think sleep is now a priority for me. So even if you know someone texts and says like, "Hey, gonna do a six a.m. yoga," if I've like been having like consistent trouble with sleep in the past, I used to be yes for sure I'll be there, and now I'm like, oh, actually no, I'm gonna try and work on my sleep. So sleep and rest and recovery for sure. Um, I like to eat really well. I don't always eat super healthy food I mean I try like most people to I would say you know do a reasonable job of that but I like I like you know to eat to, when I eat well I feel good when I'm sleeping well I feel good when I'm sweating I feel good and that just I would say like connection with people um before I started working at the co-work I worked from home and I hated it um just because I didn't have like face-to-face connection with people every single day um, and I, I mean, I usually did because again, like I'd be go- going running with people or going to a class, but um, I find working from home really soul crushing because I crave human connection um, a lot of the time, even though, like I said, I think I'm an extroverted introvert <laughs> um, for sure. So I would say those are the things I really, 
cannot live without eating a banana every single morning, which is a very bizarre thing. But like I, by noon, if I haven't had a banana, I will like literally like seek one out and be like, okay, I haven't had a banana yet today. I'm going to like, if I don't have any, I'll walk to the grocery store, you know, stuff like that. So bananas, music, reading, sweat, connection simple it's a, there's a simple formula absolutely <laughs> it's just like right now i'm like thanking everything to thank that uh, there hasn't been a recall on bananas because we'd have to like lock down the city i don't like, i don't know I, if, <laughs> I don't know if i could deal with with you just going rampant looking for your bananas like I used to joke that if I got to one, like if I had only one banana left, like that was essentially a banana emergency for me. Like I never let them get that low. I'm like, I usually like to have at least two or three in reserve and then I get my next bunch. Um, and I like my bananas quite ripe. Some people more on the green side, the scallop, I'm like, I mean, I'll eat them if they're green, if that's the only choice, but ripe bananas. Do you have it like zeroed into like a country of origin or a brand no, name? No. Do you have like an identifying feature of bananas where you know that's the banana for me? I don't like really massive bananas. Okay. You know, I feel like <laughs> the bigger the banana, the <laughs> less flavor. Um, so I like just an average size banana. Um, you know, some people say, do you like organic? I'm like, yeah, you know what? I don't really, I don't really like buy organic, but like consciously, if the organic bananas are more right the regular bananas then i'll splurge for organic bananas but no those are those are the things just an average size right banana for this gal i love how i took that turn people are gonna be oh this is gonna be a profound podcast like i'm gonna learn a lot of lessons and then the type of bananas <laughs> the other great thing about the banana as a fruit is when i used to when i used to work at the white avenue lemon um, I used to manage that store. I started this fun little trend of if pe someone left a banana in the back room, like it was going to be their snack or something, I'd write a love note on it. Um, so I thought it would be so nice when like, you come back to eat your banana that someone would pick it up and see the note. And sometimes I go to the grocery store with a Sharpie in my pocket and I hope that the produce people aren't hanging out around the bananas because I'll just like write or make a little heart on a banana or write a quick <laughs> note. There's Instagram accounts that have really incredible banana love notes. I'm not that artistic, so I just write a nice little message, but because you can peel it and throw it away, you know? Yeah. I mean, I suppose you could say that about oranges or a few other things, but the banana is where it's at to write a little message of love. What's what's the message of love on bananas that you were the most nervous to write or to leave or to have out? I've never been nervous about okay. that. Yeah, it's just, you know, Sometimes I write things like, all you need is love, with like a little heart, love is all you need, but it just depends, you know, or I've read a quote somewhere about love that I think is fantastic, and I'll look it up and write it on the banana. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So then, back onto the track of the profound podcast that we're <laughs> delivering here. Let's get off bananas. <laughs> yeah. The year 2019. Mm -hmm. I want you to kind of reflect on it and think about if you could address like one lesson that just stands out that you learned from 2019, what would it be? Okay, again, only one. So many. Um, yeah, I think the biggest thing for me is I had a lot of what I call unintended change happen in my life in 2019. So there were really big changes that I, that you know, happened to me versus me saying, great, I'm going to choose this. So I had some career transition. And I think what I learned from that is a how attached I was to things that a person should never be super attached to. Um, and how much I would say like I defined myself by my job. So um, when change happened, it wasn't necessarily change that I was like, welcoming, craving, or looking forward to, I found it really hard to, I would say, move myself from the perspective of being like a victim in that to understanding that I actually do have choice in it. And the only choice I have is how I'm going to be in it. So um, I would love to say that I handled those transitions really gracefully. I didn't. They were really painful. Um, I feel grateful that I've had, you know, great friends and even some colleagues and coworkers that have support, like supported me through that and just been really patient, understanding, listened a lot. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, I know it's cliche, but people say the only thing consistent is change. And 
my year last year, I would say, was was a truth of that for me. And I had not experienced that before. I felt like very in the driver's seat with things like my career, where I was going, the choices I was making, and suddenly that wasn't the case. So um, I think that pushed me in some really big ways. And um, yeah, it just allowed me to really take a step back and I think actually ask myself like what are the important things and where do I need to create some boundaries in my life where I can live um, I would say more in alignment uh, with with those things and not give 100% of my energy thought and feeling all the time to like one thing which happened to be my job so I would say that's the biggest thing is just not being so attached and like clinging to the notion of like this is my job this is the title this is what I do because at the end of the day I'm still me regardless of, of what that is or what I'm doing and um, I certainly you know don't want you know to work, worked really hard I would say like written on my tombstone for x company at the end of the day and certainly not to say I don't enjoy what I'm doing or I don't work for a great company. I do. I'm really fortunate um, to work for Lululemon, but um, yeah, I did not handle transition gracefully is what I would say last year. So it taught me a lot about myself. Yeah. Well, I think to be able to say that about the experience shows a great deal of like self-awareness and that like you're able to know like that you learned and that you shifted and that you pivoted and you learn through that and I think it's something that occurs to a lot of people and we we just need that like smack in the face that like hey like change is gonna happen whether we sign up for it or not like it happens in the fitness industry it happens in every different career I can think of like I could list them all off but we all know like places close like logistics change weather changes economy changes totally. life consequences change and it's just like what are you going to do when you're faced with change? Well, I think in most cases, it's just like get to know yourself a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. What did you learn about yourself in that process? What did I learn about myself in that process? Um, again, I'm like, there is such a list of things. Um, one, I would say is... I'm someone who really needs um, or struggled with not having information. So even when there is no information, I like being told there's no new information. Yeah. Um, and again, like I think that goes to like, I was like really clinging for the like, waiting for someone to tell me what was gonna happen when it was like, well, no one knows what's gonna happen. So it's like, you can be impatient, frustrated, annoyed by this or you can focus on the 3,000 other things that are still really great in your life your relationships your family your health like all of those other things so I think more than anything I learned a lot of different ways to support myself in like coping with the feeling of frustration anxiety like uncertainty and sureness um, that were really different for me so I think naturally for me would be to like go and run that out and you can't always go for like a two hour run on the middle of a, a Thursday. So I spent a lot of time, um, in meditation, journaling, really quiet reflection. Um, and I just found, you know, how much that helped me because I've always thought like, well, maybe there is going to be a day where I can't run anymore. Um, you know, hopefully that happens when I, I'm 97 um, but it might not and there has to be a, a, another way to get that same feeling of peace and release that I get from running so I started practicing like I just say like getting quiet and just sitting and um, it definitely wasn't a natural it's not a natural way for me but I really found value in it um, and would really encourage like anyone anywhere it doesn't matter if there's something hard right in front of you just that practice of being like being quiet and being with your own thoughts and noticing what they are and letting go of them um, I think is such a great practice of um, not getting too attached and that really helped me through um, you know what I was going through last year and like in your in your career just the greater career and not just like under Lululemon mm -hmm. and stuff like yeah you've had to make some changes and, and some shifts and it's been like just changes of of what what you deem as your your focal point and and so forth and I, i'm trying to like 
complement Carrie Doll's podcast so that people listen to both. So if they want more backstory on, on the other stuff, then they can yeah. fill in the blanks there. But uh, what, what was it like doing your very first shift when you started at Lululemon? Like, what was going through your head? And, like, you must have had some attachments to, like, the, the prior career. And you must have been, like, thinking about change in that time. Yeah, I mean, I'm laughing. I'm kind of laughing when you ask that because I'm like, my first shift at Lululemon, I had to literally learn how to take the security tags off of clothes, and it was the hardest effing thing I've ever done is how to master the art of removing a security tag. Um, But I think that when I was, so before I came to Lululemon, I was a school teacher, and I'd known for so long that I wasn't going to do that forever that I didn't really, honestly, like, I didn't really think that much about it. So I think what I took from that whole experience and what I really tried to remind myself of last year when I was really in it was when I made the career change to Lululemon or when I knew I was ready to make that shift, everything felt right about it in my soul, in my being. So it wasn't just a choice or a decision that like happened up here. It started up in my mind. So it started with a very cerebral, analytical look at like, Who am I? What do I value? What do I want to get up to? Um, I mean, that's very trite. That took a long time and that was a a long process. So I think by the time the change actually happened, I was so ready for it that I was just like, yep, this is what it is and this is what I'm going to do. And um, I was confident that if it didn't work out, like I could go back, right? Um, So I think from, um, you know, those those first few days at Lululemon, I was just happy, happy to be doing something that, you know, I felt like really aligned with who I was as a person, my values, um, and was a new challenge. I'm someone who really likes a challenge. So whether it was like learning how to take the security tags off product or, um, you know, lead a really big team, which I, I'd never done before, I, I enjoyed it. It wasn't always easy. There were times I'm sure that it was, no, I know there were times where it was horrible and I was thinking, you know, what have I done? But I think there's always moments like that, even if you, even if you love the things that you do. I mean, when I think about even running, there are moments where I'm like, why am I doing this? You know, those are, those are a little more fleeting, but yeah. So I don't think I ever did have a moment where I, I would say that I doubted the choice. I was fairly confident that I'd, I'd made a good one. And like I said, it, it took me really knowing that like I made that choice at at not just like a like a cerebral or an analytical level that I like felt it that I was like yes like this this is what it is and now I trust that if I'm going to make another change that like I remember I know what that feels like so I think I have to I have to remind myself of that sometimes when I'm thinking like oh what the future what am I going to do where am I going to be doing it where am I going to live how is this going to happen I'm like oh like get out of your head because those types of um things or choices I think are a lot of the time best made from the heart but if you're like me I've got to get my head out of the way like to let that happen yeah well I think it's you basically answered the next question that I was going to ask which is (laughs) so great because it's like we're going in the same direction with with where we're taking this conversation and it's essentially like you talk about how you almost need to know like what what is next and that's it's impossible to like draw that out and be like, oh yes, in five years, this will be this, that will be that, this will be this. Or if, if you sign up for this, that it's going to be like it says in the paper. Like every scenario, no matter which human is behind it, is going to be, it's going to have some extent of unpredictability. Like uh, if any scenario, I, I can think of anything that I've ever done where I signed up. And I was like, okay, um, should be the exact same for the next five years. And it's never. And it's like no fault of anybody. It's just the natural process. And like when, when we have all these like steep expectations for what things will be, then it kind of, that's what increases the stress that we experience in that situation. Like I kind of, the fitness industry is the best example of it because if you sort of expect things to happen in such a way, your stress level is going to be so much higher. But if you're like, okay, and tomorrow is going to be a good day, and I'm going to take every opportunity that I have, 
and then I'm going to compound that over to the next day and the next day, but I, I can't think about like, okay, two years from now, I'm gonna have all these clients, I'm gonna be at this location, and there's gonna be no other competitors, like everything's always changing, and like, you see that in like, even with like, with teaching, like I'm, I'm a child of two teachers, so I understand how like, contracts change, budgets change, mm -hmm. kids change, parents change, there's all these factors. So for that person that's listening to this episode, that is just, they cannot stop thinking about that expectation. Like, what's your best advice for them? Like, you're being a mentor to somebody else, and how do you get them to get out of their head? Yeah, I think that a question I always ask myself is, what am I uniquely qualified to provide? Not just in, like, the narrow definition of my job or what I'm doing, but, like, all the time to the world. So I think if anyone spends some time thinking about that... Um, it's like you said, like if your only focus is like X number of clients to get to this location to go here, you might start to do things that really aren't unique or authentic to you. So it's like, you know, if you ask yourself, but, you know, as a, as a trainer or me in, in my job or me um, as a runner, like what am I uniquely qualified to provide like these moments in this situation? I think if you have a really good handle on that, it doesn't really matter what you're doing per se and also like the magic follows and that's hard for me to say because I'm someone who you described who's like oh I like to know what's going to happen um I like to have a plan um I'm always asking okay like what's the plan um it drives certain people in my life a little bit crazy that I always have to know like what's coming what time exactly when are we doing this and you're right like that's not that's not the way it works so I know um I know for me it's like really being able to get down into like, okay, so if I, if I'm going to actually live by this understanding that we, I can't control the outcome, I really can't, I'm going to really focus on what I'm, what I'm able to uniquely to provide the world, the situation, um, my job, uh, my relationships, and, um, just, just being me, you know, I think is, is the best that anyone can do on any given day. Because all that stuff is going to happen. You, you can worry about it or not. And it's going, it, it will yeah. happen in one way, shape, or form. Which you have really, a lot of the times, no say in. Again, it's like back to that idea of, you know, the only thing you actually have control over is how you're going to show up in it. So it's like, I don't know, the, the, there's a quote about, you know, we're all climbing up the mountain. You can either complain about your sore feet or you can sing on the way up. It's like, well, you, you best get singing because... It's going to make that experience so much better if you choose to sing the song versus worry about your, you know, blisters and toenails falling off and sore feet. So <laughs> it's true. And I would say if like the podcast has taught me anything, it's like communication style. So like you being self-aware that uh, you almost need to have some kind of an idea of what the outcome is. Do you approach your conversations or your communications with the people in your inner circle in a different way than you did before you kind of discovered that about yourself? I think that I'm more aware of how people experience me, if that makes sense. So I can tend to fall into the like intense, like I get a lot of feedback, like oh, I used to think you were so intense and serious and um, which sometimes I am, a lot of the times I'm not too though. So I think I'm more mindful of how I, of just how other people experience me, you know? So um, I know that a lot of people say what they count on me for is like very straight feedback, honesty. I'm gonna tell it like it is. Um, and I'm also really aware that the delivery of that um, is important, you know, all the time. So making sure that I show up with, um, or I communicate with, with love and generosity from a place of um, trying to like elevate the situation, the other person and myself. Um, and I think also it's taught me to be a better listener um, because I want to also like know and understand things from someone else's perspective. And like to do that, I can't be talking, I have to be listening. Um, and listening with like my full presence, not just listening to like be in a conversation and get my own point across, like actually like listening just to listen with, with no agenda, um, I think is, is something that's like probably changed or evolved in me over the last, over the last little bit of time for sure. 
it's not always it's not always great. I mean, it's not always easy or awesome. Um, I especially think because so much of communication this these days is not verbal. It's like via text, email. Um, sometimes I'll like about to send an email and then I'll read it twice and I'll be like, oh, like my tone maybe sounds a bit harsh and I, and I actually don't mean it that way. Um, so I'm going to like go back and take to that and make sure that it, it, it actually, the person on the other side reading it isn't just like, whoa, like what's happening with Andrea and Edmonton today? So um, I think would think that's important to me. I, it's a good reminder too to slow down. Yeah. Don't need to like just rapidly type it and send it. It's like, no, slow down, have a read, like make sure you've landed and it's come from a place, like I said, of kindness, love and generosity and not just like get it done, get it off the list, get it out of the way. Well, even with like, uh, with texts and stuff and you talk about like how, how things can be misconstrued and I've learned definitely in the last year or two that certain like emojis just set me right off. Like, I think I was getting a text from Farah and I was, oh no, did I do something wrong? And she's like, no, no. And I'm like, okay, well, when I see that emoji, I feel like I did something wrong. Like I, there's... There's a list of them that I just don't like. Like sometimes just getting an emoji, it's like, yeah, whatever. Like that's that's the impression that I get. And I know that people don't convey that. But then when I know that that's how I'm going to like respond and that I can communicate that to my people, then they know how to like say what they would like to say to me rather than confusing the living crap out of me. Totally. But like two years ago, I would have seen the emoji, assumed the worst and felt sorry for myself. Which is cool. Like a podcast taught me that. Like just to ask better questions or to dig deeper. And just like the friendships that I've had over the last, like just since being involved in the industry over the last like three, four years, like in the different capacities, just learning to like lean into friendships and like be with them through every shift, pivot and thing that changes. Because like if you, if you have a friend in your circle for an extended period of time it's inevitable that you are going to have to lean into the friendship through every shift change that they go through that you go through and it's it's quite the experience it's like a roller coaster for sure because that nothing stays the same right there's always going to be changes big things little things that feel like big things little things that end up being big things um happening for for people on any given day so yeah you're right it, it's a roller coaster he, you just got to hold on <laughs> so in your own experiences with uh, being on the roller coaster you got the people that are wanting to buckle up ride that thing with you are there any people that kind of stand out for you that have kind of been along for the whole ride whether you had to lean into it or not oh yeah for sure so well my sister so my younger sister, um, Ainsley, she lives in Winnipeg, so unfortunately we don't live in the same place, but um, she's definitely my first phone call or text message or email when I feel like things are hard, uh, which she'll often answer with, oh, I feel like this is your quarterly crisis. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm like quarterly, and she's like, yeah, usually about once a quarter, <laughs> I'm like, okay, great. So I find... Um, I find great solace and people that like know me well enough to know that like, you know, I'm probably, um, just needing to, to talk it out. Um, and also will give me, you know, some honest feedback in that too. So my sister, I have a really, really dear friend down in Calgary named Wendy. Um, when I was a teacher, I was a learning strategist. So I looked after, um, a group of kids in my school that had really significant learning, learning and behavior challenges. And I shared the A to H alphabet with a guidance counselor named Wendy. So we worked really closely together and um, I call her my Calgary mom. Um, and so I remain really close with her even though I don't see her all the time. Um, and again, like she's definitely someone who when life feels hard, I will usually pick up the phone. I have so many great people here in Edmonton and really fortunate. Um, I have only, some, I've only lived here for, I think it's like six and a half years now, which I, again, I'm like, oh, I lived here for six and a half years. How did that happen? But I'm really blessed with a really wonderful and supportive circle of friends um, who support me through, through a lot. And I have like lots of different pockets of friends too. So, um, you know, some I've met through the world of running 
Um, some I've met randomly through other people. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky that way. I, some of my friends still, I mean, I have probably like a, uh, every couple month conversation with, I call her my oldest friend literally because you know, when I was three months, she was born and we've been friends our whole lives. So I still like, I talk with her every couple months. So um, and those are the people where I know like the conversation's not gonna be five minutes. I'm like, I need to book like, I need to put in my calendar at least like an hour, an hour and a half because that's how long I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be on the phone and be like hash through what we need to, what we need to share and talk about. So yeah, those, um, I feel lucky. I know not everyone has such a, I would say deep circle of friends that they go really deep with and, and I do and that is, um, that's never lost on me. Yeah. What do you think contributes to you being able to sustain like that, that circle of, of deep friendships? I think it's just commitment to staying in touch. I mean, I, when I, when I, when I, I moved to Edmonton via Regina, so I had a little pit stop there for about 10 months and, um, I lived in Calgary for a long time before that. And that was a really interesting experience for me because I felt like the people who I thought I would stay in touch with when I left Calgary weren't necessarily the people that I ended up remaining in touch with. And that is not saying anything about any of those people. They're all really wonderful people. I think it's just an ebb and flow of life. Um, but yeah, I think it's just like making an effort. And like I said, like my friend Mandy, who's my oldest friend that lives in Victoria, um, we make an effort to like, can you, can you talk this week? Okay, great. What time? Sunday at two. Okay, perfect. It is in the calendar. And if someone says to me like, Hey, do you want to do this? I'm like, Oh, actually I can. I've got, you know, I've got, I've a conversation with a friend that, um, I'm, I'm going to, you know, maintain because it's important to me. So that, and then I think too, sometimes it's like, gosh, I just feel like I have so many people that I don't have to see all the time, but when I talk to them, I feel like I may as well have seen them yesterday. Um, I feel like, you know, in some ways, social media is supportive that because you see what's happening in people's day-to-day -day lives. Although not all of them are users of social media. Like I would say the four people I've listed here, Mandy, my sister, Wendy, I was like, who's the other one? Maybe it was only three. None of them really, I would say are people that use social media all the time at all. So like sometimes something with my sister, I'm like, what is going on with my niece and nephew? Like send me a picture, please. I haven't seen one for days. Um, so yeah, I think it's just like when I do have the time, like really honoring it and cherishing it and making a, an effort to be like fully, fully with them when, yeah. I'm, when I'm with them. And I like that we kind of talk about how like you have to put, you have to put some sense of work or accountability into like the friendships and relationships, which kind of makes it a little bit more achievable for anybody that's going through a time when they kind of feel like they're they're isolated or they they are longing for those deeper connections like it's it's just like training in a gym you got to go in pick up the dumbbell do your reps do your bicep curls and that's how you get the the bigger arms and for like people with like deep connections and stuff like they they had to put in their reps they had to reach out they had to reach out they had to reach out they had to go to the coffee meeting without like having to postpone it and stuff like that and i think it's it gets lost on people in this world like as you say social media connects us but does it connect us like like we see we see things and we kind of see that people are okay but i found by like asking a couple extra questions you learn a lot more about like what's going on with people and it's oh, like for sure it's it's nuts what what a person can tell you when you ask the extra couple questions totally and i mean social media also is just like you see what people are choosing to share right which you know maybe some people aren't sharing a lot of what actually is is real for their life so i think with the people that you're close with or connected with or you can go deep with you know that's just going to be like a cursory glance of of what's happening and like anything, it usually isn't the full, the full story. Yeah. In all of your experiences living in the places that you've lived and doing the jobs that you've done, have you found that you've ever like outgrown a person? I think like outgrown is the wrong word. I think that friendships evolve and, and I don't think that people necessarily change, but I think people are a constant evolution. Like when I think of myself in my like mid twenties, like I'm just like, Oh my gosh, like I, 
I'm, I'm different than I was back then. So I think there are times where people are in your life for a reason and a season and they're not going to be there forever. Um, yeah, and I think that's something that I've become okay with as I've gotten older. Um, I feel like, yeah, I think it's also an understanding that like for some people even like that might happen with you, right? If you stop hearing from someone or for whatever reason, right? It's like, oh, like, you know, maybe they've just evolved, so they've, they've moved, they've, they're, they have other priorities in life. So yeah, I, I think that's just a normal part of life. Like, I mean, I think for me, the geography is definitely has something to do with it because I've moved. So it's like when you, like when I moved to Edmonton, I didn't know a sing, I didn't know a single person. So it's like fo like forced to like meet people and um, figure out sort of who I want to spend my time with and um, yeah I think I think as you evolve in life the people that you surround yourself with all also change and I think a lot of it too is just like common interests right like when I was twenty five I wasn't I wasn't tr like training for marathons or anything like that so by name by that alone like I wasn't necessarily surrounding myself with runners right and now like a lot of my like dearest friends are, are runners because we get to do that together so yeah I think it changes for sure yeah and I think that was a great spin on it too because it's like we we do evolve we all evolve and everybody listening to this changes in some way shape or form but an example that I came across in my own life is like I I thought I was basically the same Chris at this point that I was kind of at the beginning of the year and I ran into it into a friend that I hadn't seen since the beginning of the year. And they're like, oh, like how you talk is different. How you present yourself is different. The questions you ask are different. Like what happened? So a podcast that I blame the podcast. Like, it's just like everybody, if they, if they stick to a certain thing or if they have different interests, like they change. And my, my personal experience is like, Instagram is one of the most, it's a very powerful thing, but it can also like bring you down in a heartbeat. Like I was, I was kind of like looking through like people that had been following me and I came across like some that I knew from like 10 years ago and I was like, oh yeah, like they're a dad now. This is great. And then I looked further and I was, oh, they, they unfollowed me. And then I was, I was upset by it at first because I was like, man, I just like that picture of their kid. Yeah, I'm so pumped, but then I thought, well, I was like, okay, like, what are they doing now in their life? Um, what are their interests? What what are their priorities? Mm -hmm. And, like, their, their interests are not fitness. And, yeah, I think it's awesome that they're a parent, because I think it's awesome when everybody makes that next step, whatever their next step they want it to be when they make it. I'm like, hell yeah. But they're going to be looking for things that match them. And so where I was like sad at first, I'm like, oh man, like they're not cheering for me. Well, it's like they can't. They only have the capacity to cheer on their parent friends or to cheer on like their maybe they're in like a, a beer league hockey thing. They gotta cheer on them, and I'm not in a beer league hockey thing, so they're not gonna get anything from me. And it's not like it's not like they wouldn't be like, oh hell yeah, Chris, them his best life. But it's just like. We only have the capacity to have so many people on our like metaphorical table. And it's kind of like when uh, you're playing Monopoly and you're laying out all the properties, well, you only have so much real estate on that like family table. And sometimes you have to like put a property on top of another property to be able to see what's all laid out there. Like we, we can only focus on, I think there's research behind, you can only focus on like seven things or something, something like that. And I could be misquoting, but in any case, you can't think about 30 things. Yeah, and it's also like, it's, I always think like, it's it's not you. Like that person just made a choice for whatever reason. And it's like, it's not, it's not personal, it's not you. Like that shouldn't stop you from, or anyone from like being who you are, doing what you're doing, or thinking about yourself in a certain way. It's like, ah, that they just made their choice. And that's like, that's great for them, you know, whatever their reasoning. But I think the coolest part of this like segue that we've taken is because a lot of people will hear this and they're oh they're talking about me but like from the outside in we'd almost be taken aback by how many people listening to this are all thinking the same thing regardless if they are doctors For or sure. nurses just everything because we are all in our head 
And I think social media kind of like gives us the il- illusion that this person is bulletproof or this person has never felt alone mm-hmm. or like yeah. some of the some of the most like surrounded people still have that feeling of isolation or like nobody is like me totally stuff like that and so that's why I guess like every so often just out of the blue kind of like you and the banana thing I just kind of like I get this gut instinct of like yeah I'm just gonna send a random message to this friend of mine and be like sending you good energy for the day and if they think I'm just like some kook that just sends good energy all day, fine. Got nothing to lose. Yeah. But on on the off chance that they kind of needed that, I did it. I checked the box. And I think uh, that's that's an important thing to remind people of, like where we might not know the the outcome of what is to come in the future. We do know what we have control of. We we're able to show up big for ourselves. Mm-hmm. And we are able to put things out for others that help or remind them to show up big for themselves and just kind of give them that little like, hey, you're not quite alone. Like, you got people that are cheering you on, even if they don't have any idea whether you had breakfast or not, or like what totally. the plans are for the day. Like, it's important. Yeah, for sure. So, what is community for you? Because I know you're a big version of community. I feel like community is the most overused word in society right now. Especially like the last like three months. It's like Yes, I feel like all of a sudden I'm like, I wish people, including myself, would stop using the word community. Oh my gosh, it's driving me nuts. So yeah, I've I've had I would say in the past like two years, I've had some interesting conversations about this. Like, what is community and what should community be? I think right now, um, the debate I have with myself in my head or um, the conversations I'm having is that there is this notion when people use the word community that everyone is invited. And I think why, like, what's like not eating me, but what I'm thinking about it is I'm like, oh, it's actually not true, right? It's like the people that are like you or the people that can afford it or the people that have like earned a part to be a part of your community or the people that are community. So it's not for everyone. It's actually exclusive. It's not inclusive. And I'm not saying that to make people wrong. Um, I mean, for me, and I talk about the run community all the time and it's like, people will say like, oh, like, do you think the run community is inclusive? And I'm like, I sure I think it is. And then sometimes I'm like, but actually, yeah, no, it's not inclusive. Um, so I think, how I feel about community or what community means right now to me is, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I have an answer to that. Cause I feel like I'm at a little bit of a crossroads for that for myself and, and what that actually means. Um, my greatest wish is that when people use that word and they say it's about community or it's for community, or this is the community, it's like actually stopping and thinking about like how you're using that word, because I actually feel like it has a, a decent amount of power. And I also feel like it, it goes a long way to be exclusive, like I said, versus inclusive. Um, yeah. So again, I, I don't know if I have a, a hard and fast answer to that, but it's something I find myself thinking of a lot. Because again, all of a sudden I started feeling like community, community, community. This is for the community. We're doing this for the community. This is in the community. Be a part of our community. And I all of a sudden was like, ah, too much community. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the combination of just, well, mostly social media, because somebody sees a word and they're like, oh, I like that word. I'll use that word. And people can leverage a word. And people, like, there's so many, so many different takes on it. But, like, you got me thinking when you were talking about your take on the word and your experience with it. And it's just, like, if only we could have a way to represent what that should represent in the sense that... Uh, Anybody willing to show up to the event, to the anything it is, uh, we're willing to learn something from them. Like, if somebody shows up and we're not willing to learn from something from each person, then is that community? No. Like, we should be able to learn something from people of all backgrounds, of all ages, all values. Like, just because people are different doesn't mean you can't learn something from them. doesn't mean 
that they can't help you grow as a person. So I think uh, perspective is a pretty helpful tool in the toolbox because like if there's anything that I've learned basically like growing up rural community then coming to Edmonton it's like, wow such diversity like for sure like the first year I was like whoa where am I because growing up in a country school you there was certainly a large amount of like uh, like First Nations, mm -hmm. Indigenous people. Um, and then there was like a few, I think we had like two, two Asian students. And we, that was it. That was the diversity. And that's what I grew up around. And I'd work at the, the nearest large city. Like I, I, Wetaskan was where I had all my first jobs. And again, like some diversity, but not that much. And so you just kind of, you adjust to that and community feels like, okay, it's like, I, I associate with these people that I see, I have something to learn from them. And you almost like automatically adapt to that. That's where the limits are. And then you move to Edmonton and it's like, totally, I had to evolve. I had to learn to see things through a different lens, but it made me a better person. Mm -hmm. Like I would, knowing what I know now, I'm like, so happy that I am the way that I am in that granted I am not perfect I'm always gonna like struggle to adapt or struggle to evolve or just not not be able to see things through a different lens the first time but uh being able to be like an inclusive personal trainer and just be someone who like I can meet a different person like ask them questions learn about them and develop myself like it forces me into a world of more more abundance because like in in this podcast alone i've met so many people that weren't born in canada mm -hmm. and i learned what it was like from where they came from versus if if i was closed off to that well i just missed out on like 56 life lessons and a really rock solid friend mm -hmm. And same goes for like people with a, with a different, uh, like if, if they identify a certain way with like LGBT community, like if you're not willing to be like, okay, so like what's, what's your day like? Like what, what do you do in your day? What's your routine? If you're not willing to, to learn from them, like you miss out on probably some of the coolest little tricks and stuff throughout your day that you could ever have. So I think if people are willing to adapt and learn a bit more about themselves and see what they can get from the people that do surround them, then community is a great thing. But if they're kind of like stuck in their pattern and they're not actually, it's kind of like uh, going and buying a table desk lamp and never plugging it in. It's like, I have a lamp. Hey guys, I have a lamp. Everybody, I have a lamp. And they never plug it in. Well, for me, if, if I was to define community, it's about having a lamp and plugging it in. Whether, no matter what what's going on, you're able to plug that in, you're able to find the electricity to get it going. It's the weirdest analogy in the world, but I hope that people are picking up what I'm throwing down. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we all have our like little analogies that make the most sense to us, you know? It's good to share those, for sure. Well, I'm, I'm full of analogies. Like any client of mine, they go, man, like, he has a personality. Like, it's just like you can't explain anything normally <laughs> but nonetheless it's it's good reflection for people to hear that kind of stuff yeah for sure so if you were to identify three people maybe five people depends how many people you have mm -hmm. that you really look up to who would they be my sister for sure we really admire her um she is so focused and persistent on creating a really incredible life and I think that my sister is someone who really lives like truly to her values um which I really really admire that's one <laughs> like um oh my gosh this is going to be really hard I'm like again I'm like only five but as I say that I'm like oh I got one um people that I really 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 look up to my friend Shana 
So Shana Dion um, is a woman who I randomly met. She um, works at the U of A First People's House, and I reached out to her um, looking for guidance and wanting a conversation about land acknowledgement. So Shane is a Cree woman from the Kihewan First Nation, um, and she's just an incredible human being. Again, I think she's so like clear on who she is, her values. I appreciate so much, um, just like the goodness in her. I think that she um, teaches me so much about um, kindness and patience. Um, so I'm really randomly so grateful that I literally like so like said so like I could email this person so I just emailed this person and now I, I consider her a friend and um, just someone who I admire I admire a lot for sure. Um, I mean, gosh, the runners I spend time with in Edmonton. I don't know if I can like nail down one. I feel like that's like the sweat community that I spend the most time with probably is just with runners and I'm constantly just admire in like awe and admiration of the tenacity and the ability to do something that's really freaking hard um I know I have a friend um Lauren Andrews she just had an incredibly successful race down at the California International Marathon and um I know what it took like to get that result and um I think that is just like I think would say endurance athletics in general I'm sure everyone's got their thing but that's where I've spent most of my time is in endurance athletics and um yeah to like persevere through the training and then to persevere through the event itself like I mean mile 35 or kilometer 35 of a marathon is hard it doesn't matter how amazing of an athlete you are it's going to be a really like incredible mental battle with yourself so um I think there's a lot of runners that I really um have deep deep respect and admiration for my uh former running coach Kate Gustafson um she's a true world on Instagram people should follow her she's incredible um she is the um really my first like running coach that I've worked extensively with and you know fun fact she's actually from Kenora where I grew up and um I'm you know decently older than her so we didn't really have like like we didn't know each other growing up I, I would say like I knew of her um and randomly I think the year I one year I ran the Manitoba Marathon I finished fourth she finished sixth or seventh and she ran up to me in the finishing shoot and she said oh like are you Andrea from Kenora and I was like yeah and she's like oh I'm Kate from Kenora and I was like oh my gosh so nice to meet you we followed each other on Twitter um Instagram wasn't a thing at the time and you know, she said to me, I just wanted to let you know, like, how inspired I am at the things you're doing and running. And I was like, oh, well, geez, thank you for that, because I'm not doing anything in running, um, really at all. I'm just out here, like, trying to, trying to do the best I can. And um, fast forward a few years later, it was a cold January day, and I was on Facebook, and I saw that she was going to do um, high altitude training in Kenya, and that she had started a run coaching business. And I admire her for her sense of adventure. She's always up to like something interesting and and new and um, she is an incredible coach and I think she's the person that has taught me a lot about um, I think she's the first person in running where I was I faced like a decent amount of disappointment where like the times weren't coming. I was injured a lot. And she always asked me more about like what was going on in my life versus like what was happening in running. So she'd see that I had like a bad workout or I'd text like, oh, I was supposed to do the workout and this happened. And she'd be like, okay, tell me what's happening in your life first. So I appreciated that she always really saw me as a whole person. I think that's it. I'm yeah. going to go there. But that was a... I've given like very in-depth descriptions about my why. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I mean, I could list so many people um, again, but you know, sort of just like, list them now those are those are sort of the groups I would come up with my sister Shana Kate and then I mean there's there's just too many too many runners for me to list <laughs> it's an awesome list like to be able to like expand upon the why and all that stuff and a point that I really like that you brought up was like seeing a person as a whole person I think uh we can all do more of that 
like we don't have to beat around the bush we can all do more of that mm -hmm. to see a person as a whole person yeah. and to see people that we admire as a whole person too and not just like the people that look like they're having a hard time because if we're just looking for people who are having a hard time we're missing out on a lot of people that might need to be seen as a whole person at, at a certain point in time i'm really honestly inspired by people that are just very real and share authentically but i guess that the struggle is real you know so i think there's enough of like making it look easy and i think um i'm really inspired by people who are like you know i'm doing this or i did this and it's not easy um doesn't matter what the it is could just be life in general um but yeah i i i tend to i'd say like gravitate or learn the most from um, from those kinds of things for sure and the struggle is real doesn't matter who we're talking about what we're talking about struggle is real we're all climbing the mountain absolutely you can either complain about your sore feet or you can sing on the way up <laughs> so to keep us on track for our time frame, I have to ask you the question that I ask all of my guests. Okay. And it is, if you had one piece of advice on how to live your life in the most true to you way and to the fullest, what would that piece of advice be? Be yourself and never stop learning. Never like, never end the quest for like more, but like just more like knowledge, more learning more curiosity about the world around you and and how who you are and how you show up in that i think that's such a great part of the adventure of of this thing we call life um is there's always another level for for you yourself um to to learn about so yeah be yourself always be a learner and for the year 2020 what's the biggest change or habit that you want to have and have be something that you can sustain? In 2019, I took a step back from racing. I didn't run a single, well, I, had, I ran two races, but I didn't run any marathons. So it was the first year in 14 years I didn't run a marathon. And the reason for that was I wanted to rediscover the joy in running for me. I really lost that. It felt like a chore. I had to do it. I didn't look forward to it anymore. And I found it, which is really exciting for me. And so I think I'm eager to explore how I can sustain that. And if I can sustain it, um, if I so choose to like jump back into a race, which I, I don't, I still don't know if I will. I've had a few people ask me like, what races? Are there any goals? And I'm like, I don't really know right now. Um, just because I'm happy going out running when I want to, how long I want to, when I feel like it and not really being attached to a result or a training plan has felt really good for me. So, I mean, I think that's the biggest thing is just really noticing when I am in the practice or feeling joy when I'm doing the things I love to do and saying yes to those things and when I'm not being okay with like saying no even if they're things I've always done or places I've always gone or people I've always been with just being okay with that yeah no thanks you know that's awesome and it's just the the end outcome is really we should all be trying to fill our plates with things that bring us joy and not trying to hold on to things that don't because if anybody's in control of it it's us totally hundred percent. Well, thank you for joining me today. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, Chris. It's a great conversation. If you made it this far, not only am I incredibly appreciative of you, I, yeah, I'm mostly appreciative of you because I know I get long winded. So thank you for your support because sometimes I don't just stop and just say thank you because what you just did is you gave me probably an hour and 20 minutes of your life to listen to a conversation that I had with Andrea where you could have listened to all kinds of different podcasts. And I encourage you, if you are interested in Andrea's podcast, go look up her episode with Carrie Dahl if you haven't listened to it already, or go find her episode with Open Up and Ohm, Chris Falconer. I don't know where it is, but if you find him and you hunt him down, I bet that he has a way for you to listen to it because I know I listened to it a while ago and I enjoyed it. I like his interview style. So I got to support the bald headed bearded Chris's in this world who also podcast because he is a coffee making phenomenon and he deserves to hear nice things. Thank you for supporting the lifestyle chase 
and I hope to continue talking to your ear for, for a long time, I guess. Thank you. Bye-bye.